Hello and welcome to a rather unusual and special video. Because I am a historian who also works as a history teacher, young people often come up to me to ask me very practical things about studying at university, studying at Leiden University in particular, or studying history in general, or even archaeology. Now we discuss these things so that they have a better idea of what study choices to make. And of course I always try to help them as best as I can, but there's one area that I know absolutely nothing about, and that's underwater archaeology. So I needed help myself for that, and I decided to reach out to perhaps the most famous underwater archaeologist there is, namely Gary Bankhead. Gary has excavated the riverbed underneath Elvet Bridge in his hometown Durham in the northeast of England. Every time he was diving in the River Weir, he found loads and loads of amazing artifacts. One type of objects really stood out, namely cloth seals. Gary has investigated them in incredible detail and has published a book about his research. You can find more information about his work on diveintodurham.uk. But in addition to that, he also features on History Channel's River Hunters. So we have been talking and because we both find it important to inform young people, Gary has agreed to let me interview him. Now, considering his research, there was only one place for us to meet the Lakenhof in Leiden, and you will find out why in a bit. The museum, the Lakenhof, has kindly offered to open its doors for us for this interview, and we are beyond grateful for it. So Gary's on his way to tell us more about his research and about underwater archaeology, because he knows best. So hopefully this will answer some of the questions that you might have. Hello, good morning, Gary. Hello, good, good morning, Manon. Thank you for joining me today. Um, well, well, thank you for inviting me. This, this is an incredible museum. I'm so pleased to be back here. I know, right? Yeah. So you are an underwater archaeologist. That's right, yeah. Right. So let's just start with this. When I was a little girl, I wanted to become an archaeologist. I really did. But I ended up studying history instead. And when I had to make that study choice, I had a good idea of what it would take to become either a historian or an archaeologist. But up until today, I have no idea what it would take to become an underwater archaeologist. So can you please explain that? Definitely, yes. The, dis the discipline of archaeology is, is one thing. Um, and scuba diving, in many ways, is totally different, totally separate uh, leisure time pastime pursuit it's very easy to merge the two um, but in my example I was I've been a scuba diver for over 35 years I've dived extensively around the UK in shore waters very experienced doing what I do and it wasn't until later life when I took up archaeology so it was easy much easier for me to merge the two if I was an archaeologist now a fully qualified archaeologist who's interested in going scuba diving and wanted to investigate a particular area, that would be quite challenging actually, um, because the, to, to, to develop your skills and experience scuba diving takes many, many years yes. really. Yeah. yeah, And although rivers look benign, they look, they look calm and peaceful uh, on occasions, you know, they still can be very dangerous locations. And the whole concept of being buoyant underwater um, suspended just above the riverbed and excavating a trench is, is hard. It's a hard thing yeah. to do and it, unless you're experienced and you've practiced it and over a long period. So it's hard to become an archaeologist first and then an underwater archaeologist. But if you are fortunate enough to be yeah. competent scuba diver, then you could perhaps do it that way. So you were a diver first and then an archaeologist? Yes. Yeah. yes. So we could say that there's more dangers involved in being an underwater archaeologist than being a regular archaeologist? Yes, um, I, in, in many ways I'm very fortunate. I live and work in Durham City, 
a stunning world heritage site that has this lovely river. Um, river passing, Weir. The River Weir, yeah. yes, passing. It actually it creates this huge peninsula and it, I guess it's the very reason Durham became the city it was with its cathedral and, and pilgrimage uh, to the Shrine of St. Cuthbert. But the river at Durham is, runs um, relatively clear. So about 10 months of the year, the visibility underwater is really good. Quite often I can see five, six, seven meters underwater, when actually I only need to be able to see as far as I can yeah. reach. Um, and, um, but there's other hazards in there. And we have river traffic, so there's lots of boats yeah. whizzing around, which is really, you never want to get hit by something. Um, it's a very popular rowing uh, for the university. And then you've got sharps and other objects that... Glass and stuff. There is glass. Uh, but in my, in my example, there's a lot of pins as well, and the pins are always sort of yeah. sticking your gloves. But, um, and then there's that element of um, contamination as well. Potentially there's sewage discharge into the rivers, which is never nice. So you, there's an element of uh, ensuring that you are clean and you don't um, take on board any nasty little yeah. hazards. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in terms of retrieving an object, obviously it differs too because you're, you're underwater. So you can't just use a brush to clean it out, or can you? Or how does that work? What tools do you use underwater? Yeah. So that, that's really when you start merging the discipline of archaeology, the, the field work, and how to actually excavate art objects. It's almost similar. First of all, you need to sort of understand the nature of the riverbed. So I'm very fortunate at Durham, it's solid bedrock. But the bedrock's got lots of gullies and channels that run through. And that's where the objects are. Oh, yeah. So today you can't see those gullies and channels. They covered up underneath a, a layer of sort of detritus. But um, using typical archaeological methods, I excavate the riverbed by hand. I never use a trowel. Okay. Yeah. I loosen the, the pebbles and the cobbles and the small stones, move them out, waft away the, the silt. All with your hands yeah. and your fingertips. Yep. So Ideally, if you position yourself um, at a right angle to the floor, and you, that allows you to waft, just simply waft the silt away, and you have fresh, clean water coming in. And visibility is everything. You need to be able to see what you're doing. So you're methodically going down through the, through the layers. And although there's very little uh, stratified layers in there, I think there is, but we can't really be definitive and say yes. But basically, the, the quick rule of thumb is the deeper I dig down with my hand, the older the objects yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, so it's very much a case of using the river itself to flush away the, the dust and the silt, get that out of the way, move all of the loose stones, the, the, the roof tiles, the, the cobbles, the, the house bricks. The rubbish. Yeah, the rubbish, yeah. the detritus from the city. And, and then literally using your fingers just to very delicately move away smaller objects and just gently waft and then the objects themselves reveal themselves yeah, yeah they almost pop up and say hi i'm here <laughs> take me home yeah that sounds so lovely so i'm getting interested in in doing it once again um but i should become a diaper first so it will take some years don't don't expect to do, to do it you know within a couple of months if you're diving in the egyptian red sea on a, a roman shipwreck for example yeah. that's a different kettle of fish yeah. you know um, it's very difficult in rivers yeah but i would be one step closer to becoming lara croft and that's a life goal so. <laughs> but we're digressing <laughs> so the um, focus area of your research is cloth seals yes particularly retrieved from the river weir in durham yes that's right First of all, can you tell me what a cloth seal is? Yes, um, I brought a couple of, put a couple of examples from Durham. I'll, I'll just open this one, it's a really good one. So basically cloth seals, lead cloth seals. There we go. So very small, enigmatic objects. They, uh, this particular one is a two disc uh, or two part lead cloth seal. Um, very similar to the ones that we find here in the Museum de Lacanol. Um, they were attached to a bolt of cloth and um, they would have been folded over. So in England, from the time of Edward, Edward III, if you were a weaver, 
you weren't allowed to sell your cloth unless it had been inspected first. So a crown appointed official called an almager um, would inspect the cloth. In, in Durham, actually, it was the bishop who appointed the alnage official. So the alnage, alnage uh, officials were very unpopular people. They had the power of entry. They could come into your place of work, which was often <laughs> your home. And they would inspect the cloth to ensure that it conformed to the crown statute. So it had to be a set width, a set length, and the quality, the workmanship. And the colour, maybe? And not necessarily the colour. It, it was more the weave. The weave, OK. So it had to be relatively high standard. And if it did, an alnage official would affix one of these little discs to the edge of the bolt of cloth. So he would bring them with him? Yeah. So he would have a bag of blank seals um, and very simply just fold, push one end underneath, fold the thin strip over, align the rivet with the hole and use sealing tongs. Okay, yeah. And, and it was that sealing action that imparted a privy mark or a ligature, some royal device. Okay. Yeah. Evident, evidence that the cloth had been inspected. So in this example, we can see that this is attached to a woolen cloth inspected in London from the 16th, 17th, 16th century, this particular one. So it has the, the arms of London on that particular one. So this is a London alnage seal. Right. A typical 16th, 17th century. Um, and it's these, these bits of information that are really crucial to understand what they are. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because if you're underwater and you see, a, well, a cloth seal coming up or something that looks like a coin, can you immediately tell that it is another seal or do you inspect your finds later? Yeah, no, I am. Um, as I said, the visibility is quite often very, very good. And I can see instantly what these are. And for me, that is clearly a lead cloth seal. You know, if I held it that far away from me, it's a lead cloth seal. Um, and I can dis distinguish between lead cloth seal and maybe a coin, for example, which potentially that would look like. It it's, could be a button, but... Yeah, a button, yeah. So the visibility is so good, I can tell what they are. And every single dive that I do, I seem to find lead cloth seals. I'll find maybe two or three lead cloth seals. Every time? Every dive, yeah. So I have found 344 lead cloth <laughs> seals. So far, only in the river weir? In, in this one section of the river weir, just downstream from the 12th century Elvet Bridge. Right, because your book features a map of New Elvet with the, the fine size, indicating the fine size. So how do you decide where to dive? Is that a coincidence or do you come back specifically to that place every time? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So that, strangely, everything I find is always downstream of the bridge. If I, I, I tell myself that if an object fell into the, the river from the upstream side, it must have been flushed down. Tumbled down. A little yeah, bit. I think so. And then arrived at this place on the bed, riverbed where the gullies are. Yeah. So potentially there are, there are objects upstream, but I've focused all of my scuba diving activities downstream. Either side of the, of the bridge are riverside tenements. So these houses, these dwelling houses that we know were in situ as early as the 12th and 13th century. So we have the new borough of Elvet on the one side, which is really close. And those tenements are relatively narrow. They're only 18 to 21 feet wide. They would have had a commercial frontage, so where the street, where the roadside is. Like a shop, almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it would have been three or four stories high. But towards the, the rear, at the location that abutted the river, that was adjacent to the river, that lent itself to being um, ideal locations for a riverside workshop. Yeah. So if you were a member of a craft or a trade guild and you were in the business of manufacturing something, and if that manufacturing process required copious amounts of river water, then... Um, that you would an, settle there. That was you an would. ideal location, yeah. yeah. So not only do we find evidence of weaving, the work of weavers, but also dyers who by default would need loads of... Yeah, water, yeah. Um, but also many of the other craft and trade guilds, so the plumbers, the pewterers, the goldsmiths, the joiners, stonemasons, all of their tools seem to be in the river as well.
Right, so you mentioned all these different occupations. And um, what I read from your book is that there are different types of seals. So you have the, the dyer seals, the seals of the drapers, of the weavers, yes. company seals. So how can you distinguish one seal from the other? Yes, it, it wasn't actually drapers and tailors seals um, exactly or specifically. I think the earliest crown statutes required that weavers affix seals to cloth. Later crown statutes required that the work of the dyers and fullers oh. meant that they had to attach their cloth sails so people knew who fulled the cloth and who dyed the cloth. After that you had the craft and trade guilds being very instrumental in inspecting the work of their own members. So the drapers company for example in Durham annually they would elect six different wardens or searchers, six men who were competent in, in their trade, and they would operate in pairs. So they would go to see their, their, the weavers and they would inspect the cloth, and if the standard was satisfactory, they would affix searchers' seals. And then usually they would have the surname initials of the two drapers in there. So you could identify? Yeah. Okay. So it was the work of the drapers and tailors company who were appointing searchers or wardens yeah. to inspect the quality of the work of their, um, the cloth that they were buying. So actually a finished bolt of cloth may have half a dozen yeah, cloth seals yeah. attached to it. Yeah. Have you ever seen that? Pieces of cloth with multiple seals? No, you've got to imagine that the river at certain times of the year can be quite violent, you know, it, it, it does flood very often and uh, any textile just gets abraded and degraded and disappears. But actually, textile does survive in some, 28% uh, of the cloth seals that we found. Small fragments then. Yeah. Yeah. Little, little scraps and part of my PhD, I, I um, successfully extracted four little scraps of textiles. We, we identified four cloth sales from various periods, extracted the cloth, and we did all sorts of analysis on that. So we looked at the type of, typically it was woolen cloth yeah. that survived. Linen, uh, as you find here in Leiden, uh, didn't survive. But wool does, and, and you can see the individual wool fibers. You can see that work out the, the warp and the weft thread. You can work out the thread count, so you can allude wow. to the fineness of it. Um, and actually, we did some ultra high performance liquid chromatography and for the first time ever in the United Kingdom we successfully extracted colorants. Color, okay. Yeah, related wow. to specific dye stuff so we could actually say what color the cloth was when it was dyed. So all these little details from, from well, more analysis yeah. of the textile that remained. The, individually these can tell us so much. So much, yeah. yeah. You yeah. really can. But you do write that um, in isolation, anything that you have found in the River Weir can only tell us so much about, well, the history of the object. So I always found that historians and archaeologists need each other. They need to collaborate to construct the, the full picture, or at least the bigger picture. And given that you conclude that your finds should never be studied in isolation, but should be seen as part of a bigger collection of artifacts. Yeah. And given that you have consulted many documents from the archives, yeah. would you agree? Yeah, 100%, yes. We're very fortunate in Durham. We have this, what we describe as an embarrassment of riches in terms of our written archives. Our history is recorded in abundance. So we are, it's a relatively easy process to work with historians and, and go back into the archives and access the, the written records that refer to textile procurement. Yeah. There's uh, the bursa at the Monastery of Durham, and, uh, the Monastery or the Priory of Durham, they, the bursa was responsible for multiple procurements. They bought everything that was necessary for the day-to-day -day running of the monastery and they record literally thousands of procurements of cloth and it details the quality of the cloth uh, the date and time it was purchased, the uh, price of it, who bought it and where from. Uh, so you have to go back into the archives. Archaeology, these little small metal objects are wonderful 
when we analyze them, when we look at them in the lab and use stereo microscopy to see that how they were manufactured, how we read these objects, that's great and we can start to build up a picture. But if you have that opportunity to reach back into history and access the archives, and I was very fortunate in my research, I had an opportunity to come here to Leiden, yeah. to come to the museum and identify parallels to the cloth seals I had. And even better, find um, and actually see the, the tools that yeah. they were affixed to the cloth. They still yes. survive. They're here, yeah. So that was about eight years ago? Yeah, I, I would say that, yeah. It's, uh, I, I, I travelled to, um, to Germany, to, to Augsburg, where many of the seals come from, for, to, to Leiden and also Harlem. So it seems, based on the evidence of the research occasioned by looking at these small objects, going, looking at the archives, but also travelling to identify parallels of these objects. Yeah. And then you can confirm the provenance. So Durham, even though it was far away in the northeast of England, it was trading extensively with the Low Countries. The trade networks are probably forgotten by most historians. They never refer to them, but these small objects can talk about them. They're the evidence that the trade networks existed. Material culture evidence in, in these examples of cloth seals that were affixed to bolts of cloth here in the Low Countries and, and exported perhaps to London and then up the coast to Newcastle, ah. or maybe, maybe direct. Maybe, oh yeah, because I was going to ask you, let's say if I were to find a cloth seal, or maybe you, if somebody would find a cloth seal with the coat of arms of Leiden on it in either York or London, does that automatically mean that these two cities traded? Or does it yeah, uh, not 100%. You, you've got to imagine that there may well have been a Hanseatic connection. Okay. So um, where was the nearest Hanseatic port or centre in, in England? Because they did have um, businesses set up, established, where they would trade directly into them. But actually the port records for the city of Newcastle, for the port of Newcastle, going back to the 14th, 15th, 16th century, mention procurement uh, cargoes of Holland cloth. Right, so maybe not directly to Durham, but from Newcastle to Durham. Yes, so Durham obviously is a landlocked, it's, it's 15 miles inland. Yeah. Um, it was always served by the ports of Hartlepool okay. or Newcastle, yeah. predominantly Newcastle, but the two. And, and also good cloth was transported over land quite often right. using, yeah, yeah. using the river networks as well. So again, for the full picture, you would need the, the documents. Yes. If there are any. Yes. Yeah. Good. Well, you mentioned the, um, the clergy of Durham, and I noticed something that I really want to um, confront you with. Okay. You have discovered that um, the Priory of Durham, they ordered um, all these fine textiles and all these nice cloths, but the most precious linen that they ever ordered were, in fact, from the Low Countries. Is that correct? It definitely was, yes, it was. Um, the, the four northern counties of northern England were um, very um, prominent in producing linen. They supplied linen for all of England, but it was classed more of a house, like a housewife quality, suitable for bedding, for sheets, for aprons. Yeah, for everyday use. Everyday use, yes, um, headdress but the luxurious linen that would be suitable for a gentleman's band or a lady's handkerchief. Um, or even in, 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 as you mentioned, the, the, the priory and the churches for their livery, you know, yeah. for their, to, to use a surplus. You know, you, everyone can imagine, can picture a, a member of clergy wearing a white yeah. uh, uh, robe. Yeah, and it has to be precious. Yes, yeah. so they, um, although linen was available in Durham, we have records of the monastic uh, establishment of the Priory of Durham and also our local churches, St. Nicholas Church being a good example, spending um, maybe six times more to buy the much finer quality linen that was coming over from the Low Countries. Yeah. Right, so I guess if it ain't Dutch, it ain't much. <laughs> right? <laughs> You've said that before, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I think you're right. Yeah.
the quality was in Europe, certainly not the local. Yeah. The local now, another funny story in your book is, or maybe not so funny for the people involved, but something that got my attention is um, about this year, I believe it's 1771, yeah. when the River Tees flooded in County Durham, so not City Durham, but close to Barnard Castle. That's I right, yes. And um, something happened. A dyer operating there had his cellars flooded and where the textiles were kept, of course. So I assume that they have been underwater for some time because of that. Yes. And then something had happened to the cloth that, let me, let me quote that. The cloth attained a color beyond his most sanguine expectations. So what's up with that? How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, it is an incredible story. So Barnard Castle is located right in the very southern border of County Durham. Historically, it used to, North Yorkshire was the, the other side of the bridge. And just on that south side of the bridge, even today, the building's still there. Um, uh, it was a, quite a tall building, but right at the very bottom, um, where the dye operated, that's where he would boil his dye stuff, ah, his yeah. vat. So he had a kettle filled with um, tammies that had been dyed, these very lightweight fabrics. And I guess that's what he was doing. He, he dyed um, cloth at that very location. So in 1771, as, as you suggest, this great flood came down and filled, actually drowned his cellar out and filled it with silt and mud and, and everything. And probably it would have taken him days to bail the water yeah. out and clean the mud off the cloth. But when he did, and when, he, when the cloth was dried, stretched on a, perhaps a tenter frame, as you say, it attained this incredible color. And he was able to command great price for it. Everybody wanted to buy this wonderful colored cloth. Um, and he got more orders. So people placed, oh, can we have some? Can we, we'll have more of that, please. So he tried in vain to replicate that mistake. That mistake. Yeah. What he wouldn't have known is that that great flood would have swept down from the Pennine Hills, the local, the uplands yeah. area of, of sort of Western um, Durham. And that's where you have a lot of peat bogs. So the peat itself ah. would have had tannin okay, um, yeah. or tannic acid. And perhaps it was a combination of different tannins and maybe ions from the river water that helped attain that colour yeah. and there was nothing in 1771 that would have enabled him to actually work out yeah. what had happened so he was unable to reproduce that wonderful coloured cloth. So it's like a miracle like the cloth attained another colour overnight? Yes okay. so he was unlucky, lucky in one way but very unlucky he couldn't, he could, he exactly. could have been a millionaire. Yeah and what could have featured on the cloth seal that would be attached to that certain cloth to mark how special that colour was. Did they do that at all? No, uh, 1771 was after the time of the Alnage system. Ah, okay. So uh, there was no requirement for weavers or dyers or, or fullers to um, use cloth seals. Okay. But we know that they were being used after the Alnage system ended. Uh, more of a, a hallmark yeah. or a merchant's shipment mark. So uh, cloth seals became, actually I've got one here, became much larger. Much larger? Then, yeah. Yes, than the 16th, 17th century. So, oh, right, yeah. So you can see. So on there would perhaps be the name of a merchant. Um, there'd be a consignment or a shipment number. So you might find them attached to the later ones. Certainly in 1771, it would have had something like that. Somebody was transporting that cloth somewhere and they would have affixed a cloth seal to, to, to prove that. Right. And could, would you be able to read from the cloth seal how special the, the quality was or the colour was? Would it be on there? Not at that time, no. It would just be purely by sight. You could see, wow, that, that looks a wonderful colour. Yeah. Go and feel it. Yeah, it's a beautiful tammy in that example. We love that. Oh, look, the cloth seal suggests it's, come, it's available yeah. from Barnard Castle. Um, this such and such merchant has transported it. You know, let's let's track him down and let's put another yeah. order in. So, <laughs> yes. so right now we are in the Lakenhall of Leiden, which is the actual place where the cloth from Leiden would be checked and taxed and sealed. But if I understand it correctly, but do correct me if I'm wrong, you have found hundreds of seals in Durham, but they were never produced in Durham. 
Is that correct? No, no, actually. Um, we have many from Durham. So it is very clear that the, the weavers, we know weavers were operating in Durham. The Crown statute applied in Durham, but actually it was the bishop. The, we were a Palestinian county, yeah. which meant the bishop had jurisdiction. So the bishops of Durham would appoint their own alnage officials. Ah, oh, okay. And they would inspect the cloth. So regard, given that there was this Crown statute, this requirement for everywhere in England to do this, it was controlled by the bishop, but we do know that weavers were operating. We found weavers' cloth sales, we found dyers' cloth sales okay, yeah. uh, in Durham. So definitely, and, and their archives survive. We know the types of cloth that they were weaving. So yeah, yeah so the cloth sales come, yes, from Durham, definitely, um, but also from north of England, so from York, from Leeds and Wakefield and um, Manchester. We have cloth sales from London. Uh, during the 17th century, we have um, worsted cloth coming from Norfolk and Suffolk. And that would have been produced by uh, the Walloon community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who were immigrants who, who came under license from Elizabeth I uh, to effectively resurrect the, the worsted industry. And then at, from Devon um, and Wiltshire, so the West Country, we have broadcloths and curses being produced. And then we have to look over the channel to the low countries and um, to find these incredible trade networks yeah. that nobody knew about. Yeah, with marks and initials from the continent. Yes. Yeah. So I was, I was worried for a, for a bit that there wouldn't be any guild hall for the textile guild in Durham, but there was. Yes, so the, the minutes from the meetings of the various craft and trade companies survive. Okay. We know that the weavers were meeting um, on a weekly and a monthly basis. We know who the members are. They met in the uh, toll booth in Durham Marketplace. Okay, that's yeah. yeah, and that's where the rules were set and established. But they would be operating independently in their own um, places of yeah. business. Yeah. yeah. In conclusion, having found so many cloth seals in the River Weir, what did you find out about Durham? Durham is um, not an isolated outpost far off in the north of England. Whatever the fashion um, was anywhere in Europe, it seemed that we had exactly the same quality um, and coloured cloth in Durham. So for example, the fustian cloth that was being woven in Augsburg southern Germany, in yeah. southern Germany, yeah. a, a city over 900 miles away, yeah. we have fustian cloth Augsburg cloth seals in abundance in, in Durham, over 900 miles. So it, it, the biggest revelation, I guess, is that the cloth seals were coming from all over Europe. We were trading with so many different countries. It, it is incredible. And that, I guess, is the biggest revelation in, out of all of this. So it revealed all these connections and it's just pure evidence that there was trade between all these places. Yeah, this is the material culture evidence that confirms um, that we were, without a shadow of doubt. This is wonderful new evidence. The, the cloth seal collection, the 344, constitutes the largest collection of such objects available for analysis outside of London. So this is, really is a, a, important. an important collection. Yeah. It really is, yeah. Wonderful. And you can start to understand why. Yeah, and you keep on finding more even. Yes. I, I need to stop finding yeah. them. <laughs> you need to stop diving. <laughs> yeah, I've got, got too many objects. Do you think it would be worthwhile to go outside and search in the canals in Leiden as well? Yeah, you know, I've, I've been walking backwards and forwards and looking down at them and just wondering, there has to be. The history here, the built buildings, there has to be millions of objects in these canals and I'm so tempted. Do you want to go on? Did you bring your diving gear? I've got it, yeah. Would you like to go and have a go? Yeah, okay. sure. Right. Yeah. Go on, yeah. let's go. <laughs>